we have a little bit of a technical problem just with the introduction and the introductions aren't important uh, so i'm going to improvise unless there's an intervention from andrew rowan who would have introduced me which is unnecessary not because not because i need no introduction but because introductions are not needed um, if you were here last week uh, for the first sub uh, webinar i gave an overview and the overview is in the video so i'm not going to repeat the overview what i'm going to do this time is to select a subset of 28 questions that i had sent to all of the participants uh, the last time to make sure that at least this subset of them is actually treated in the discussion fortunately um the, the speakers last week were were excellent but there were four of them this time. Uh, uh, fortunately, this time we only have three, which gives more time for discussion. Everyone's here. All four speakers from last week are here and the three speakers from this week are here. And I hope that the discussion will be even more interactive than it was before. I know already I have advanced knowledge that there's gonna be some disagreements among the, uh, the uh, speakers. So that's always useful. That always brings out even more information. So I would like Laura to switch to the first of my PowerPoints. The, the first set of questions concerns what is sentience, because this is about sentience. So I asked the panelists, and to a certain extent, I'm asking the audience as well, what do you mean by sentience? What is the difference between an organism or species that is sentient and one that isn't? sentient. We have to have that at the forefront of our minds, otherwise we're talking at cross purposes. We may still be talking about cross purposes if the, to the extent that the panelists disagree on what sentience is. We'll see about that. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, if, you, if you want to identify yourself um, in the attendees, if you want to identify yourself in your question, add your name to it and uh, I will, I'll go over the questions as they come in and I'll pass them on to the speakers as soon as their um, allotted time is used up. And they'll have a, each speaker will have a, a, a discussion session devoted only to their talk, a short one, very short, depending on whether they run over time on their presentation. And then the next speaker, and, and by the way, in the, in the speaker's private um, discussion time, you, the audience, can also ask questions of the speaker, but you'll get the, the biggest opportunity to ask questions when the three speakers have spoken, their three private sessions have already elapsed, and then we're in the general discussion session. And there too, I'll try to mediate. So the first, set, the first question was that, could I ask um, uh, Laura to advance it to the next one? What is another what is sentience question is what is the biological function of sentience by which is meant what adaptive advantage, what evolutionary advantage does sentience confer? That is a trick question because there's no one on this planet who can answer that question. It's called the hard problem of uh, cognitive science. Why and how do organisms, species feel? I'm taking the capacity to feel as my definition of sentience and trying to explain how and why organisms feel is called a hard problem because it looks as if it looks it can't be true but it looks as if everything should work just fine for a darwinian world if all organisms were just darwinian insentient darwinian machines machines that could survive and reproduce and learn and even talk. All of these things are functions that could, uh, robotics is showing that they're to a certain extent, they can already be produced by robots today. So the hard problem is despite that, organisms are, or at least some organisms are sentient. Why and how does uh, uh, the nervous system produce sentience? That's the question of the biological function. Next one, Laura, please. What is the phylogenetic, what in the phylogenetic tree, excuse me, where in the phylogenetic tree did sentience first appear? 
uh, participants will have different ideas about where what the cutoff point is where you're ready to say that uh, this this species is sentient. For some, for some ancient uh, thinkers, the cutoff point was at the human species. Anything below the human species wasn't sentient. Today, I think almost everybody who's informed agrees that vertebrates, which means mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians, amphibians are sentient. Um, there's, there's disagreement for invertebrates, not among the speakers we've had so far. We've had specialists on bugs, on insects, and on, and on um, invertebrate ma marine, ma marine animals. And uh, some at least of those have, have already been agreed to be sent just as sentient as the vertebrates. And one of the topics today will be, should there be a double standard for vertebrates and invertebrates? Irina Mikh Mikhailovich will be discussing that. So besides the cutoff point in the phylogenetic tree, where you, uh, where you assign the beginning of sentience, uh, the hard, hard problem, as I just said, is how and why do you think sentience evolved? I don't think that there's gonna be definitive answers to this here, but you'll hear some of the um, prevailing hunches. Next one, please, Laura. Evidence of sentience. What kind of sentience do you consider, oh, sorry, pardon me, what kind of evidence do you consider evidence for sentience? I'm asking this of all of the panelists and the audience can ask themselves as, as well. What would you take for what you consider to be sentience? What would you take of, as evidence for the fact, for the presence of sentience? And what, by the same token, what kind of evidence you consider evidence against sentience? What kind of thing would there have to, uh, what what would you have to be observe be able to observe in order to be more confirmed that the sentience or, or the the species or the organism that you're referring to is not sentient? Next slide, please. Invertebrate evidence in particular. Now we ask this question because this is a webinar on invertebrates. In particular, in the case of invertebrates, is there cognitive and behavioral evidence of sentience? And if so, which evidence and why? In many ways, the, 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 the first webinar's talks were about that. Each speaker gave the, the kind of evidence that they took to be evidence for sentience. Next one. This is a whole uh, nest of six questions related to bioethics, the, the implications, the ethical, moral implications of sentience. So the first question is, do you think non-human species, a non-human sentience matters morally? Does it matter whether a non-human species is sentient? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Second question, do you think that non-human sentience is adequately protected by law today? Non-human sentience in general. I had another shadow question about whether you think human sentience is adequately protected by law, but since <clears throat> I'm picking out the uh, the, the key questions, I set that aside. You're, you're free to answer that question as well. Uh, do you think vertebrate sentience is adequately protected by the law? Then do you think invertebrates are sentient, just as it was asked uh, a moment ago? And if so, do you think invertebrate sentience matters morally? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Last question, do you think invertebrate sentience is adequately protected by law? And with that, I cede some of my uh, time for the first uh, speaker. You've already, you already know that Jonathan Birch is here and Bob uh, will, will be here, he's, he's gonna be a little bit late. Bob Elwood, I think is here, Lars Chitka definitely, and Helen Lambert. And the first speaker will be Giorgio Valortigara, who is at the University of Trento. Uh, his, his specialty is cognition and sentience. He's, he's done across different species. He's done research on bees and flies, on sentience, as well as uh, in, in insects, other insects, and cuttlefish on cognition. With that, I pass the, uh, the, uh, the uh, voice control over to Giorgio. Bienvenue. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for this kind invitation. Let's see whether my PowerPoint would work properly. I think so. Um, so let me start with a personal recollection. Uh, when I was a young graduate student, I found quite serendipitously some bizarre uh, uh, lateral biases in the behavior of uh, young chicks, uh, which were the model animals who I was involved with. Uh, I was very excited by these findings, and so I have a chat, a conversation with a very important um, uh, colleague, a senior professor working with split brains and uh, um, patients with lesion, an expert on brain asymmetry. And he told me more or less, look, brain asymmetry is a landmark, is a uniquely human feature that is associated with higher cognitive abilities in humans alone, and uh, language and consciousness. So basically uh, what you are looking for in chickens has nothing to do, to do with that. It's simply not the real stuff. Okay, as you know, a lot has changed since then. And today we know, I think it's uh, widely recognized in the neuroscience community that vertebrates, uh, birds, mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles have asymmetrical brains. But interestingly, recently it has emerged also that invertebrates too have uh, asymmetrical brains and behavior. I think the very first evidence was collected for insects by uh, Srinivasan, a, a colleague in Canberra. It was at the time uh, 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 spending a sabbatical in Australia, so I visited with my colleague Leslie Rogers, Srini Lab, and we decided to uh, investigate asymmetries in, in, in insects. We were not at all experts at the time on the behavior of bees, but we use a very simple and well-established techniques, which is this one, sort of Pavlovian conditioning in which you present an unconditioned stimulus, sugar solution, and you have as a reflex response is the extension of the proboscis associated with a conditioned stimulus of scent, some odor. And just a few pairing is enough in order to obtain uh, classical condition. That is the presentation of the odor alone is enough to produce the proboscis extension. Uh, so we did some uh, uh, work looking for recall of these olfactory memories in which uh, we cover temporarily by a silicon compound the right or the left antenna of bees. And then we look for recall. And what we found was striking because there was excellent recall when both antenna were in use or only the right, but not at all when the left antenna was in use. So we wonder what sort of mechanisms in the brain could be associated with this striking behavioral asymmetries. And so we studied first what is going on in the sensilla, in the antenna, and they seem to be uh, present at electron microscopy in different numbers to the left and to the right antenna. And then also we look for the responses of uh, uh, neurons in the antenna using electroantennography, sort of equivalent of EEG. And more recently, we we'll, we'll go deep into the brain, measuring with calcium imaging the response of the interneurons that from the um, antenna lobe projects to the mushroom body's sort of associative cortex. And what we found is that when a pulse of scent of odor is presented, you can see that even at the level of single neurons, there is a clear higher response, stronger response from the right neurons than from the left neurons. So uh, it seems that the uh, brain of, inver well, of insects at least, but there is evidence also for other invertebrates is asymmetrical uh, in behavior and in the structure of the nervous system. That's interesting, obviously, but uh, if I consider again the um, the comment of my old mentor, I must admit, 
reluctantly that this tell us nothing about the fact that honeybees or other insects are uh, uh, in any way uh, sanctioned. Uh, and the same problem obviously is not just for brain work, but it is also for evidence for um, uh, cognitive uh, sophisticated ability. Lars, during the, the past webinar, presented some of his beautiful work showing very sophisticated ability, cognitive ability in honeybees. We did similar work uh, recently, for instance, my PhD student Maria Borto trained bees to discriminate between different numerosities, for instance, two and four, four and six, and training was for choice for the smaller or for the larger numerosity, and there was control for the continuous physical variables. And then there was transfer, we checked for generalization uh, for congruent smaller size or congruent larger size. So there was a sort of generalization for the from the discrete to the continuous. And these are able to do that. I show you some example. This is a bee which has been trained to discriminate between two and three in the domain of number. And then is presented with two identical numerosity and is choosing uh, 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 the, the smaller one or vice versa, trained with number to select the six in this case, the larger, and then presented with two six numerosity and he generalized to the larger ones. Again, we know that this kind of arithmetic abilities in our species can be conducted in some cases in the absence of any accompanying escorting uh, uh, conscious uh, representation. Uh, so what we need, I think, is some sort of general idea about the reason why at uh, some point during the evolution uh, having sanction has been necessary in some way. And in this way, we can think of proper mechanisms in the brain to look for. So some conjecture could be done, in my view, uh, on the basis of, uh, of an old idea which has been put forward by Thomas Reed, the Scottish philosopher, and uh, beautifully developed more recently by Nicholas Humphrey. And according to Reed, there seems to be a double province of the senses that serve to make us feel and to make us to perceive. He made the example of, of, the, of the scent of a rose. Scent of a rose is at the same time a sensation, something which is happening to me, with a value, uh, uh, with a valence, and it is also the sign of something out there. And this is what he called perception. You can say this is just elucubration from uh, philosophy, philosophers, but actually uh, Nick Humphrey showed that there could be, uh, uh, the, the distinction could be made apparent in a sense in some pathological condition. You know, this is a famous and very old uh, movie showing Ellen, the monkey that has been studied by Weisskrant and Humphrey, showing blind sight. This is supposed to be a blind, cortical blind monkey because it has a lesion to the cortical, to the visual corte cortex, but actually has shown some extraordinary recovery and it can move in the environment um, apparently. Uh, not as a blind animal. And what is going on here has been shown, it was being apparent when looking at the behavior of humans in similar condition in which you, can, you could have verbal reports and blind side patients have at the same time the ability to perceive in the sense to perform appropriate visual motor behavior, say pointing, grasping an object, but at the same time there's nothing appearing, so to speak, in the theater of the consciousness. So what is the reason for this splitting of the double province of, 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 of sense? Well, uh, one possibility is that this splitting is produced when uh, active movement started in the course of evolution. Obviously, we know that the very appearance of the brain has been related to, uh, uh, to movement. The brain is not for thinking, the brain is for, for moving. Uh, but active movement also has a very peculiar uh, 
problem associated with it, namely the necessity to distinguish two varieties of the stimulation that, are not, that cannot be distinguished in terms of the local stimulation, but in terms of their origin. This is the warm dilemma uh, Bjorn Merker has mentioned. Consider the case in which you remove a, a worm from the ground and then you stimulate the worm. Obviously, you will have as a result of the stimulation of cutaneous uh, 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 elements, uh, some sort of de defensive reaction. But the point is that when the worm is crawling into the ground, there will be similar cutaneous stimulation. And in, in this case, no defense reaction. And the worm is per perfectly happy, which means that it should be able in some way to discount cutaneous stimulation, which is contingent on self-produced movement. And, and I think this is a trick, the basic trick in order to have the distinction between what is happening to me and what is happening out there, Thomas Reed was mentioning. And we know the physiological mechanism, which is at the base of this distinction. Uh, it has been discovered in the 50s, uh, last century by uh, Eric von Holst, and independently by Roger Sperry, and it is the idea of the uh, efference copy or the corollary discharge. This is from a textbook because it is very well known. And the idea, very simple, is that every time uh, there is a motor command sent by the brain to muscle, there is also a sort of carbon copy of it, which is sent to a comparator to be compared with uh, uh, sensory signal. Consider the case of a movement uh, in the world of, of, of an object, and therefore the sliding of signals on the retina. This sliding could be produced either because really the object is moving or simply because the eye is moving. And in order to put this, this distinction, a corollary discharge is used in such a way to discount, to nullify uh, the, uh, the, the sensory signal. So I think that, uh, uh, and I argue in some paper, I don't enter into the details recently, uh, 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 that could be the starting point for having sanctions. So in brief, I think it feels something to be a worm. Don't ask me what is this, what's the nature of this feeling, I don't know. But I think it's very likely that it has sanctions simply because first it has to face the Thomas Reed problem of the double province of the sense. Second, because we know that the physiological mechanism is there, uh, efference copy has been described for insects, but also for worms like uh, uh, the C. elegans, for instance. And what is needed is simply sensory and motor neurons, muscles, and at least one interneuron. That's enough. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Giorgio, for being so economical. You obviously could have said a lot more. Um, now, let, and I hope you will. Uh, let me uh, open the, oops, it's not my, it's my, one second, I have to turn on my video. Um, and I, at this point, I want to say that I'm going to read some of the questions from the audience, but the panel, should has priority. If you have any questions you want to ask or comments you make directly, do it now. Turn on your your um, video and your mute and, and your and your voice and ask the speaker. I'll leave a little pause if there's no one speaking out loud. And uh, I'll read the first question from the from the audience. Uh, it's a classical question, um, and it uses somewhat out of date categories. But the question is, what is the difference between consciousness, sapience, and sentience? And uh, I, I offer it to Giorgio, but if, if someone else wants to chime in, that's fine too. Well, I think that the way in which you use the, the term consciousness is a typical uh, polysemic term. Uh, it means a lot of things uh, in ordinary language. So in my view, I, I am pretty sure that other colleagues and philosophers would disagree. For me, sanctions correspond to that minimal 
phenomenal level of consciousness, likely uh, the fact that you feel something to be that particular creature. So to me, it identify with uh, experience, with having felt experience. Very good. Now, an, a question from Eric, a very good question from Eric Schwitzgebel, which I'm sure you've encountered before. Uh, could a simple robot with efferent's copy also count as sentient by your criteria? In principle, yes, but I think we need some more specification about the kind of efferent's copy I'm talking about, uh, uh, because I, I was afraid not having time enough, but briefly, uh, the, my idea is that the original response of organism uh, to incoming stimulus was basically a bodily reaction, as has been supposed also by Nick Humphrey. Uh, so originally, it is a motor action. And this is the starting point. If it is a motor action, it is a bodily reaction, it has to be also associated with an efference copy. And that's the point. My idea is that rather than imagining that there is a, 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 a interaction between the efference copy and the sensory signal, I am thinking of an interaction between the efference copy associated with the bodily movement and other kind of movement of the organism. So I, I am ready to, to, to expect consciousness in a robot in which there is an initial response to stimuli in the form of a bodily reaction. And therefore this robot, first of all, should be actively moving and then should have as a result of incoming stimulation, a bodily reaction on the surface or a internal representation of this bodily reaction. There's a little bit of sound. And this bodily reaction should be associated with an efference copy. If all these conditions are there, yes, I would expect that this robot would feel something. Uh, I can hear Stephen. Yes, Stephen, you are muted. Oh, okay, we will, he will be right back on. Um, so could, in the meantime, could I ask a question, Giorgio? Yes. So I, I wondered if you could elaborate on that, because I think there is something very crucial here in terms of the idea that this kind of prediction of the environment that you need to do in line with your own intended movements um, and things that go on in your environment might be really crucial um, at the evolutionary origins of consciousness, but I'm not fully sold on the idea that all it takes is a really simple neuron, um, three neuron circuit or so that mediates a kind of efference copy. So I think something is still missing, but I myself can't quite put my finger on it, but, um, but I, I'm sure that we could both, even with uh, with a few sort of electric children toys um, generate a machine that can mimic um, the simplest form of an efference copy while it demonstrably is not necessarily conscious. Yeah, you can mimic uh, the, the general mechanism of the efference copy, yes, but I, I don't think you have machine able to do the bodily reaction in the form that you could observe in a living organism with the current technology. So imagine a very simple condition in which uh, you have a finger and move the finger and touch an object. And look at your phenomenology in this case. The phenomenology is something out there. There is an object. Now imagine the reverse. You are with the finger uh, still, uh, blind and an object is moved by another person touching your finger. In this case, what you feel is something happening to you, to the surface of your, uh, of your body. I think that in order to have this, you should have some sort of local responses of the body. That is, the stimulus is incoming and you react locally, for instance, with a sort of uh, uh, mm, mm, uh, uh, 
torsion or other. That's probably was the original response to noxious stimuli or other. And this uh, very peculiar uh, bodily action has a, a reference copy. Uh, and, and, and this should be associated with the fact that you move in the world. Um, if there is something else, as you suggest, could be, but let's try. Let's try to, come, to build up a machine, a robot with this kind of property and able to have a phenomenology in which you can distinguish the two cases I, I am describing. And that at that point, if you have this kind of phenomenal, phenomenological distinction, well, that for me is uh, sanctions. All right, thank you. Okay, fair enough. And now um, I'm going to, what I'm gonna do is uh, perversely read you two questions that you can't answer now, possibly even a th third question, but, it, but to give you a chance to reflect on it for the discussion session, because then we'll move on to Je Jennifer now. The related questions, okay. Um, Georgia Mason's at, uh, sort of takes a step forward and Jonathan Balcom's takes a step back and Barbara King echoes it. Georgia Mason says, why does the efferent's copy problem, which you explained beautifully, require a conscious solution? It requires a solution, but why a conscious solution? Uh, that's an echo of the, of the hard problem. Jonathan says, you describe, he, he takes a step back. He's, 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 he doesn't even go so far as efference. He says, you did describe the bee's proboscis extension as a reflex. Do you think it's only a reflex or perhaps more conscious? So that's the opposite. And then Barbara King follows up on, on Jonathan's question. Would you please identify, uh, uh, please clarify your perspective on the scope of felt experience in the bees? But unfortunately, you can't answer these questions. I know the three questions discussion session because now I'm going to introduce Jennifer Mather, who's uh, been here virtually and in real life in Montreal many times. Uh, her specialty, she's at University of Lethbridge, and she, her specialty is octopus sentience and cognition. She was also one of the consultants for the uh, award-winning movie, My Octopus Teacher. And I pass the spotlight to you. Thanks, Stephen. Laura, could you start the PowerPoint? Okay, well, I have to say that Stephen challenged me a few days ago because I was talking about what I was going to present. And he said, I want you to give evidence. I want you to give good evidence and tell us why what you believe about octopus sentience is backed up by the information. So I'm going to have to rush through this. Could I have the next slide? In a way, the same thing as Giorgio said, I think that sentience in the very, very simplest way is about monitoring, monitoring what you do, monitoring what you receive, monitoring what you decide to do with it. And one thing I want to say, because I think it's terribly important is we are talking about invertebrates. We must remove ourselves from our anthropocentrism and start thinking of them themselves not them in terms of what we know and what we are, but in terms of what they are. And I think this kind of monitoring that I'm going to talk about could be monitoring of self and also can be monitoring of experiences and processing of experiences. Now, I think that sentience doesn't have a particular modality. I think sentience doesn't require any particular structures and it doesn't require any particular experiences. It is a much bigger thing than that. And I don't think we will find it in functioning in the same way necessarily or with the same content with different animals. And we have to keep this in mind. Remember invertebrates are 99% of the animals on the planet. So the vertebrate experience is trivial even though it's the only one that we've got. Next slide, please. I think in terms of sense of self, and I'll be using perceptual experiences here, 
that in terms of visual, we should realize that cephalopods, including cuttlefish, squid, and octopuses, do not see color. They do perceive the plane of polarization of light. It's an important cue to their place in the environment and also shared by insects and crustaceans, by the way, but not by us. In terms of chemical cues, not well studied, we have to remember, and it is actually a parallel with our perception, that we have both distance and contact chemoreception. And it's not well studied. We have a lot more to do before we understand how we understand ourselves, for instance, in terms of chemical cues. The other thing I wanted to mention is mechanical perception, which is balance, touch, muscle position. And to some extent, I think we can say for cephalopods that balance in particular is simply processed automatically. We just don't need to worry about it in terms of sentience. And by the way, that's the same with us. Our balance is also processed automatically. Next, please. If you look at visual information, now one thing that when we talk about blind sight, we should remember is that humans process visual information in many different levels in their visual and brain system. And it looks as if the same thing happens with cephalopods who don't seem to be monitoring their skin pattern. And they also fail the mirror test, which is a very vertebrate bias test to whether one has a sense of self. I think that what we're going to find in terms of self-recognition is that it's dependent on chemical cues. And this is definitely not yet proven. There's so many things we could do to help to understand cephalopod sentience. In terms of body senses, it's a very important area to look at, which is the damage input and how, if you have damage to the body, how you have pain, how it's monitored, how it's processed. I'll talk about that a bit later. And in terms of body position, um, sometimes people say that the octopus is not able to monitor the position of its arms, for instance, and that's not true, but it's probably true that most of the processing of position takes place in the periphery. Next, please. Oh, can you come back a sec? It's a very, very important study in cuttlefish. Bring it down a little bit so I can see it. And that is what unfortunately is called the marshmallow test because I think it's a horrible way to describe it. But Schnell proved that cuttlefish can refrain from action in order to get a more desirable prey. So they can delay, they can know that the prey is in front of them, know that if they try to catch it, that they won't get it, it'll be blocked. So they can actually, to some extent, monitor their motivation, which I think is very important. Okay, next, please. In terms of oneself in the environment, um, both vision by landmarks and vision by plane of polarization are monitored and used. In terms of brain control, as Giorgio was just talking about, there is lateralization at the same time. If you look at the old work by Wells and Young and Muntz and Sutherland, the storage of information begins unilaterally, but spreads to bilaterally. So in some sense, the brain is the center of a unified um, sense of self, sense of in the world. And something that's interesting in very little study is to what extent we integrate the different, that the octopus integrates the different senses. And Anderson and Mather discovered that for learning to open jars, octopuses didn't just get the visual stimulus, they also needed a chemical stimulus. So they combined the two different cues at two different times. And then they began didn't, we didn't finish this, but we began to be able to remember that the chemical cues were 
giving them important information and they were beginning to learn to use the visual only. So this is something that I think unity of the different sensory modalities is important. Next, please. Now, these I've pretty well been talking about interactions within the animal itself. And I wanted to talk a little bit about interactions with the outside world. It's hard to catalog exploration and play and to say just exactly what it means. It means the animal is seeking information, definitely a motivational thing. And it means the animal must have some kind of central monitor, central controller that indicates what information needs to be sought. Can you move it down a bit? There's something at the bottom, but I'm not sure exactly what, right. It's important to realize, and this is cuttlefish, but I'm sure it would be true for octopuses, that the context of external information can be monitored and used. So Jose Alves and colleagues proved that the cuttlefish could learn in terms of a rewarded stimulus, what was rewarded, when it was rewarded, and where it was rewarded. It's a very complex memory system. And I think it's very important that the animals are able to do this. Next. What about storage and use of information? This, what I was talking about before was unity across senses at one time. And this is really um, very much taking off on Jonathan Birch's idea, integration of sensory information across time. And the navigation and spatial memory use that's found in wind switch foraging is a good example. So the animal would go find some food one place, bring it back, and the next day it wouldn't look at the same place. It would look somewhere else. So that's remembering where you've been and remembering what you've done. And of course, there's a procedural memory that everybody knows about with the coconut carrying an octopus that the octopus would take coconut halves with them when they were out foraging in an area that wouldn't have any shelter. And then they'd carry them for a while and then they'd stop, open them up, cry up, crawl in and find shelter. Now again, Schnell's got something very interesting with monitoring motivation. Okay, a monitoring monitoring the future in order to figure out the, the motivation of what to do in the present. What they had with the cuttlefish was a preferred and an unpreferred price item. And the preferred one would be delivered in the evening, either predictably or unpredictably. And the animal in the daytime had the choice to take an unpreferred unpreferred prey. They would take the unpreferred prey if they didn't know that they were going to reliably get the preferred prey. If they knew that they were reliably going to get the preferred prey in the evening, they would leave the unpreferred prey. So it's kind of like saying, well, you're going to have a hamburger at noon, but if you know you're going to have a ste steak in the evening, you'll leave the hamburger. But it's very important because it is really, again, talking about monitoring the self and generating motivation and, and choices for the future based on what you know is going to happen. I think use of information across time is very important. Next, please. Now, I wanted to say a little bit, very little bit, about the idea that cognition and particularly sentience might be based on unlimited learning. Because one of the things the cephalopods do over and over is that they have an amazing ability to adapt to both a complex and a varying environment. So their prey choice is extremely wide, but it is nonetheless very guided. Similarly with predator evasion, there are many, many studies showing that their adaptive 
learning, predicting for the future about potential predators and what to do about them. So in that sense, they have a very, very extensive learning, which in some ways is probably a foundation for sentience. But they don't have completely unlimited learning. So for instance, Darmayak found that even in the egg, cuttlefish can get particular stimuli from outside the egg and that they can use that to modify their behavior after they hatch. Now this is imprinting, this is a limitation on learning and this is something that we have found in vertebrates as well. I think that learning has to be limited to some extent because learning is dangerous, you might fail. Next, please. Now, probably very important, very difficult is what we call valence. And this probably gets most closely at what we might think of when we're thinking of phenomenal consciousness. What is an animal like? It's probably better, better to say, what does an animal prefer? And I don't think we have very much information about this. In terms of positive valence, octopuses like crabs. And Ontank spent quite a while looking at it in terms of energetics. He gave them clams and crabs, and they chose the crabs. And then he went and looked at the energetic input. And for an octopus, it was more work to get the food out of the crab. There was less food from the crab, but that didn't stop it from wanting the crab. And I don't think we know why. I think that needs a lot more work. But there's a very, very much positive valence in shelter. Octopuses in particular simply are not safe without some kind of shelter. We don't know to what extent and how it's processed. We know that octopuses just aren't found in places where there isn't shelter. And we need to study the mechanism of how the octopus knows, selects, evaluates, chooses, maybe even has competition with. And I think of Bob Elwood's work with hermit crabs. So his would be a wonderful model to use for figuring out what the valence is of shelter and how it's expressed. Now, we also know that octopuses, like pretty well any animal, are aversive to tissue damage. And in terms of the study of that particular perceptual system, we talk about pain as being sensory, cognitive, and affective. And Crook has a nice recent study looking at how octopuses choose a particular location where there's analgesic if they have damage. And they also choose differently when they have a topical anesthetic versus not an anesthetic. But she did use the word affective in the paper and I urged her not to because I figured the media would pick it up and say, oh, okay, we've proved feeling. She hasn't proven affect. And I think we're going to have to think about how we can come to do so. Next, please. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I have to say that you're, you're almost using up all of your discussion time now. So it's okay. Pretty, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'll have to rely on the general discussion because this is important. Information is dealt with at several levels, weighed and combined by the different senses. I think there is no clear sentience, non-sentience division between the animal groups. I also think that the knowledge of sentience is going to be of limited information in terms of whether we should advance welfare. I think what's going to make a big difference, and I think Irina is going to challenge me on this, is how we advance welfare. Okay, can I have two slides ahead? So I'll just show this and then I'm afraid I'm out of time. I think this could be used for any animal group and I'd love to see people doing it. Okay, thanks, Stephen. <laughs>
Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to leave most of the questions for the for the uh, for the later session, but I'll give you one or two to at least think about. Um, Toby Don Smith says I abandoned the study because of the cruelty involved in harvesting alarm cues. I was hoping to look into embryonic egg learning. Do you know of a way to test this without having to harm or kill study participants? Stephanie, so hold hold the answer on that. I'm just telling you the question. Okay. Stephanie Hancock asked, do you theorize that the reason why the octopus prefers to, to prey on crabs could be chemical? Maybe they gain a beneficially preferable pheromone chemical than they that they cannot attain as well from other types of available prey. Again, that has to stay on hold. And then uh, Saeed Savet asked, does this species also respond to sound exposure and use sound components? That one you can answer very quickly. Jennifer? I'm thinking that's only fair. Um, okay. Well, okay. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll let... yes, but I don't think there's any specific response. We have not looked in terms of different frequencies and different um, loudness. I, we haven't looked at that, but I'm sure they're aware of it. Okay. okay. I think with that, we'll move to Irina's uh, presentation. Irina is a philosopher at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Her specialty is bioethics and sentience. And she's especially interested, uh, or it has been, in inequities between criteria for deciding whether vertebrates are, are sentient and criteria for deciding whether invertebrates are sentient. But she won't only be speaking about that. Irina, go ahead. All right, thank you so much, Stephen. Let's see if I can do a screen share. All right, can everybody see my my slides? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, sorry, I need to, I can't see my own notes right now. <laughs> um, how do I get rid of the, um, Laura, do you think you could help me real quick? Um, I need to get rid of the, uh, the videos from Zoom that are showing up on the right. and making it challenging for me to see what I've written. Hang on. Um, Marina, you can just um, minimize it uh, at the top. How do I do that? At the top of the video, um, there's the choice on the left. You can just minimize the whole thing. Um, sorry, I don't, I don't see that. Well, you can also move your uh, move it around so you can see that side of it if you want it. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry about this, but um, if Laura, could you help me if I if I just show this part of the screen? Can you tell me where to go? Uh, you can. You can see. Um, just do it in that, in that what if, okay let's see what if we do this how about that that's perfect okay great <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so first of all, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much to Stephen for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Laura, for organizing. Um, so we've seen both today and last week that uh, there's now mounting evidence of sentience among invertebrate groups. Um, but what is sentience? Why does it matter morally? And why, despite the growing evidence, is there so much resistance to recognizing that some of these animals may have moral standing? Um, so I'm going to suggest today that some of the resistance can be traced to a network of interacting causes that jointly lead to the underattribution of both sentience and cognition. But first, what is sentience? Why does it matter morally? Um, so let's take these questions in reverse. There's generally wide, although not universal, philosophical agreement that sentience 
is necessary, although perhaps not sufficient for moral standing. Um, what is moral standing? So a being has moral standing if it is the kind of being that matters morally in its own right. Um, another way to put it is that it has intrinsic value. Um, this can be contrasted with instrumental value. So uh, property has instrumental value. Uh, beautiful sunsets might have instrumental value because they matter to somebody else, but they don't necessarily matter in their own right for themselves. Um, moral standing is an all or nothing concept. It is a threshold concept per uh, Alan Buchanan, which is contrasted with uh, moral status, uh, which comes in degrees and it's a relative term. So for instance, an elephant and a mouse might both have moral standing. So they might both matter morally in an intrinsic sense. Um, but the elephant might have a higher moral status relative to a mouse. So in cases of moral triage scenarios, we may have reason to prioritize the welfare, the well-being or the life of the elephant, but not of the mouse or over that of the mouse. Um, so the full account of sentience, of why sentience matters morally, uh, unfortunately goes beyond the scope of this short talk, especially now that I've taken up some of my time on technical matters. But one reason is because insentient beings, those that cannot feel, can't be properly harmed or benefited in the same way as sentient beings can be. Um, a being that matters morally in its own right is one whose life can go well or poorly from its own perspective. Um, it's one who can, to appropriate Ron, uh, Tom Reagan's terminology, is the subject of a life. Okay, um, but what is sentience? Let me fix my zoom here for a second. Um, so in the literature on animal ethics and philosophy, sentience is often equated with phenomenal consciousness or the something it is like of subjective experience. But um, I think that bare phenomenal consciousness that is free of effective valence can't be sufficient for moral standing. And that's because a being who's merely aware of some states of affairs, but is incapable of experiencing them as either desirable or undesirable, isn't one that can be harmed and benefited in the same sense. Now, this is a controversial view, and I know that some of the panel will, uh, will disagree. Um, I think that it's the addition of affective valence that is positive or negative affect that transforms mere awareness into something that matters for the subject of experience. And if phenomenal consciousness is not sufficient for moral standing, then equating it with sentience um, strips it of its moral force because um, sentience is a key concept in animal rights advocacy, in ethics, in policy making. So if we want to preserve the role that sentience plays in both eth ethics um, and policy, then I think we need a working definition that's sufficient for moral standing, not one that is merely necessary. So the the proper definition of sentience, I think, has to has has to be intimately involved, um, and this is a, a point that we make in a uh, with my co-author Rachel Powell um, in a recent paper in Animal Sentience Journal, um, that that this is a necessarily moral concept, not merely a description of the way that the world is. Again, a controversial view. Um, another question we might have is about the relationship between sentience, cognition, and moral value. So some might say um, that cognition is uh, sufficient for moral standing, that all we need for uh, welfare discussions is just to show that animals is um, sapient or intelligent or has cognitive ability. Um, now, cognition might serve as evidence of sentience. This is a, uh, a position that Jonathan Birch advocated, um, or some forms of cognition, um, and thus indirectly of moral standing. Um, it might enhance relative moral status, so a being that can um, see itself into the future, might have uh, future-oriented projects that might make that being matter more than a being who is sort of living in the moment. Um, but can cognition alone be sufficient for moral standing, um, even without sentience? I think it's difficult to see how this would go, um, and I look forward to Jennifer uh, elaborating on, on her uh, explanation of how this would work. Um, partly because of what's already been said, namely that the goodness or badness of desire, satisfaction, or frustration stems from the quality of the experience, from the effect of valence. And without those, it's hard to see how you can either harm or benefit a being and where ethics would fit in. Um, now, there's plenty of evidence uh, albeit defeasible of sentience among invertebrates. I'm not going to belabor this because uh, it has been beautifully presented by the actual experts um, who have done a lot of this research themselves. Um, what I will say is that the evidence is mounting both for affective states and cognitive states that themselves might be symptoms, um, to put it in Jonathan's terms, um, of sentience of, for some invertebrate animals. And crucially, this too is a point that has been um, 
highlighted is this evidence comes not just from behavioral studies, but also from neuroscientific studies, computer modeling, and less directly from evolutionary, uh, theoretical evolutionary considerations. And just as importantly, the behavioral evidence comes largely from experiments that use similar protocols to those in vertebrate animal studies, which means if we take those studies to uh, show either cognition or sentience, then we should have applied the same criteria to other epistemic equals, um, including invertebrates. Um, now, despite this evidence, in both ethics and public policy, invertebrates generally as a group, although things are changing a little bit now, tend to be largely excluded. Um, as we saw in, in a series of talks um, last week, as well as uh, this time. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, um, partly because the, a lot of what I have to say has already been said. Um, I will just note that in the case of philosophical ethics, um, much of this, what we would call subject-centered animal ethics focuses mainly on the vertebrates. Um, and even there, only primarily on mammals um, and birds and more recently fishes. This is an innovation. Um, when it comes to invertebrate animals and ethics, they have traditionally been treated um, either not at all or typically uh, assessed in terms of their instrumental value. Again, not intrinsic value, not why they matter for the in and of themselves, but rather what contributions they might make, either ecological contributions in terms of their being uh, pollinators who, uh, and their, uh, the way in which they fit into the, the food web. Um, or uh, in terms of their agricultural contribution. So this is the more recent turn, right? Uh, turning from uh, uh, consumption of mammals and, and birds to consumption of insects as uh, for moral reasons. Uh, of course, I would note that this is rapidly changing. This very webinar is a testament to that fact. Um, in public policy as well, um, invertebrates are generally lumped into a single category and then excluded. Um, I, I will skip over this in the interest of time. Um, so in the target article that I mentioned, uh, I, uh, we cataloged the emerging evidence for sentience um, and for cognition, and we made a plea for consistency, both in terms of how the evidence is interpreted and also how the results are then applied in both ethics and public policy. Here's the, the abstract from our paper. Um, we then canvass some of the reasons that we think might explain the asymmetrical treatment of vertebrates and invertebrates as a group. Um, and so I wanna turn to these now. So why the exclusion? Um, I wanna propose uh, a network of causes. Now, this is a partial list. Um, it's more uh, aimed at opening up a conversation rather than uh, a definitive account of why it is that we find ourselves in the current position in which we find ourselves. Um, most of these are probably not unique to invertebrates, um, but they may intersect with and amplify other nodes in the network, um, some of which are unique to invertebrates. So really quickly, um, these are skeptical worries about behavioral findings. Um, so all the skeptical concerns um, having to do with the, the types of evidence that have been presented so far, um, problematic remnants of problematic evolutionary assumptions, methodological heuristics in the science itself, um, questionable empirical assumptions about the computational potential of tiny brains, cognitive affective biases, and concerns about over-demanding morality. So um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, and I'm happy to answer anything that I don't get to in the Q&A. Um, so Q, what Stephen in last, uh, last week's webinar referred to as overzealous doubters. And perhaps you won't think that these are overzealous doubters. Perhaps there, there are rational grounds for raising some of these concerns. Um, but one source of skepticism stems from, and we saw this already uh, in Giorgio's uh, beautiful discussion, uh, from unconscious behavior in humans and other mammals. So we know, um, for instance, from lesion studies in humans and uh, in monkeys and from, uh, from humans with lesions to certain areas of their, um, of their brain that visual information uh, uh, that conscious visual perception and unconscious vision guided action can come apart in uh, the phenomenon known as blind sight or appear to come in part in phenomenon known as blind sight. So um, patients with blind sight can't consciously see anything in the blind region or at the airport not being able to, um, but they can still act on that information. That was the beautiful uh, video of the monkey navigating the, the terrain. Um, this seems to show that behavior and information processing decouples from consciousness. 
And dual systems theories of human cognition, like uh, Daniel Kahneman's famous system, what system two theory, seem to suggest that a lot of what we typically do is carried out subconsciously. So think about the time you found yourself driving along the highway, right? Um, as if on autopilot and then suddenly realized that you were merging lanes. So that's system one. It's fast, it's automatic, it's non-conscious. Um, the conscious awareness of the slower but more precise system two is then only called into action when effortful deliberation is needed. So when you suddenly realize that you're driving and you have to navigate the merge, that's your system two kicking in. Um, so if we can do so much, the thought goes without being conscious, then maybe invertebrates do everything in the proverbial dark. Um, but there's some responses to this. Uh, first of all, normal functioning invertebrate animals are not the same as brain damaged humans or brain damaged monkeys. Um, second, function is not necessarily perfectly preserved in the case of blind sight. So the, um, the analogy may be slightly overstated. But a more general point is that the objection seems to overgeneralize. Um, it, it, it seems to treat no evidence of cognition as sufficient for uh, or a sign of, or symptom of consciousness, even in uh, human babies or larval humans to uh, appropriate the joke from last week. Um, another sort route to skepticism weaves its way through robotics and uh, uh, Stephen already raised this, this question earlier. Um, so some robots can mimic animal pain behavior, suggesting that real invertebrates might also behave as if they are in pain without actually being in pain. Um, while this is possible, we lack an independent basis for finding it likely, and I think we should draw the distinction between possible and likely. For one, there's no evidence that the mechanisms that human roboticists intentionally built into their pain mimicking robots that those mechanisms would have been available to natural selection in the course of animal evolution. So there's no reason to expect that real animals, both invertebrates and vertebrates, um, that they're uh, driven by similar non-sentient mechanisms. Other robots can replicate complex behavior without any, any or virtually any centralized processing or top-down control, merely through a kind of tight coupling of bodies, mecha uh, mechanical sensors, and environments. So might small-brained invertebrates do something similar, bypassing cognition and sentience to produce behavior directly from interaction among bodies, perceptual systems, and environments? Again, maybe, um, but natural selection is also frugal. So expensive tissue needs to be paid for by comparative fitness advantages. And brains are by far the most energetically costly tissue, at least in humans, um, the, the famous, uh, 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 so <laughs> in humans, for instance, uh, brains account for 2%, uh, roughly 2% of the body weight, right? And then uh, roughly 20% of energy consumption. So many of the tiny arthropods similarly invest disproportionately in expensive neural tissue. Um, and if they do, then these brains can't be merely ornamental. And of course, uh, I'm focusing here largely on uh, arthropods, insects, and um, spiders, but the same can be said for octopuses as well. Um, another uh, reason is problematic evolutionary assumptions, uh, one of which is a kind of latent progressivism. So, Stephen, am I short on time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Keep Go going a little bit more, but can, but it, you know, it's your discussion period that you're using up. So. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into my discussion a bit and then open it up to general. Um, so latent progressivism is an outdated idea uh, that evolution marches forward from simple to complex or jury rigged to optimal with humans sort of sitting at the apex of complexity and optimality at the same time. Um, and in a, in a recent, or in 2005, I guess, is in two recent paper by Jarvis um, et al. Uh, showing how uh, um, how 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 birds uh, manage to uh, increase the total number of neurons and explain why they can be uh, as as intelligent seeming as they are. Um, they note that there is a kind of latent progressivism in modern day neuroscience, which tends to treat um, non-human animal brains as sort of primitive versions of human brains, um, treating them as if they're sort of frozen in evolutionary time, which of course we now know not to be true. Um, all extant taxa are subject to selection, have been subject to selection for the same amount of time. Um, another is a preference for homology over convergence. So the idea that because invertebrates don't have any homologous structures um, or large scale structures, uh, that are homologous with uh, 
uh, that is that are stem from similarity due to common descent with those of humans that they therefore can't possibly have the same cognitive or conscious states that humans do. Um, this, of course, ignores another route towards similarity of function, which is convergence rather than homology. Um, I guess um, I'll just I'll I'll briefly. Well, I wonder. <laughs> I'll just briefly mention the rest and then maybe we'll we'll pick it up in discussion. So there's problematic dis, um, what I take to be problematic heuristics in the study of uh, animal uh, animal behavior, uh, which is <laughs> I can call Morgan's canon run amok. So um, in a foundational text in comparative psychology, Conway Lloyd Morgan provided a single passage, among other things, that has been uh, cited in textbook after textbook in virtually every single um, article on animal behavior. It goes as follows. In no case is an animal activity to be interpreted in terms of higher psychological processes, if it can be fairly interpreted in terms of processes which stand lower in the scale of psychological evolution and development. Um, but what is higher and lower? What does it mean? Um, Morgan was himself um, a had himself subscribed to a kind of progressivist evolutionary picture, which made sense at the time, but no longer does. Um, so it's hard to make sense of Morgan's canon in modern day terms. Um, so a lot of interpretation has been offered and is typically interpreted as either a simplicity principle or an anti-anthropomorphism principle, both of which I think are uh, problematic in their current application and tend to lead uh, to a sort of unnecessary skepticism or unnecessary caution. And I'm happy to say more about that, my reasons in the discussion. Um, other reasons might have to do with assumptions about brain size and sentience. I'm gonna skip all of this. Um, there's some cognitive effective biases. I see Stephen, you're trying to shut this down. So I'll just mention one and then I will end there. Um, I, I think that there are what we can call scaled biases, the very small beings sort of fly under our moral radar. Uh, they escape our intuitions. Um, lifespan threshold biases. We tend to assume that very short-lived beings don't matter as much as beings that live much longer. Um, this too, um, I think, can be easily defeated. Um, and finally, what I call the conservationist fallacy, which is the idea that because invertebrates are so numerous, there are so many of them, um, they simply don't matter quite as much as individuals. Um, I think this is a fallacy. Um, simply take a look at elephants. An elephant doesn't uh, cease to matter when its population, population of elephants grows larger, and it doesn't matter more if its population shrinks. It might matter more in terms of for conservation purposes, if we care about natural beauty, if we care about biodiversity, but from the standpoint of subject-centered ethics, a being matters in exactly the same amount, no matter what relationship it stands to, to any other being, including beings of its own community. So I have more to say, but I'm gonna stop right there. And thank you very much, Stephen, for your patience. <laughs> thank you, uh, Ira. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a few questions that are directly for you, but all of them, the rest of them are pretty much for everybody. Robert Anderson asked whether royal moral concepts are kind of universal in some sense, or are they just social, um, social uh, mechanisms that they're good for group cohesion? Uh, I think they're both, um, right? So I think if we want, uh, if we want to have, uh, so yes, um, their social norms might aid in group cohesion. I'm so sorry, my, my five month old has decided this is the time to, to start crying. She, actually, she was very quiet for the rest of it. So I command her. Um, so, so while they may be helpful for group cohesion or in some cases harmful, um, what we want out of morality is universality. So we want a moral system that is true everywhere, everyone and for everyone independent of their individual circumstances. If we don't have that, then uh, we might have trouble explaining why, uh, for instance, uh, societies that previously thought that things like where I suppose there are societies these days that think that things like apartheid or slavery are wrong, why they are wrong, right? So if we if if morality is just sort of localized in a particular culture, um, then we can't explain why uh, atrocities of the past were in fact atrocities and not merely things that people at the time thought were okay. Um, so yes, we want morality to be universal, but actual moral norms as they're instantiated in social groups are going to vary and they're going to contribute to group cohesion or potentially undermine group cohesion depending on what they are. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll just put a comment that uh, Georgia Mason made and this, this will be the introduction to the general discussion. Georgia Mason liked your distinction within 
I hate the term phenomenological consciousness, but within phenomenological consciousness, she distinct, you distinguish the neutral ones from the valenced ones, and she likes that. That's good. Okay, Georgia likes it. You like that Georgia likes it. I don't like it. And I don't believe that, ever, yes, I'll, uh, I'll go to Lars right away. I don't believe that there's any evidence that um, there's a primacy to a neutral kind of, that, that it's even possible to have neutral sentience without the valence ones. The valence ones are so obviously more uh, important biologically that it's hard to imagine. But anyway, fine, it's a distinction. Lars, did you wanna say something about this? No, I just adjusted the lamp, sorry. Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back with a wise question in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, and, and Georgia okay. also uh, asked for a question about the mirror self-recognition. Uh, she also agreed that Miller, mirror self-recognition was a way of muddling rather than clarifying, but other people mentioned it as well. Now I'm going to move down to questions that I've deferred. Back to Efren's copy. Uh, can you, do you wanna answer Georgia on why the, Efren's copy problem, which you, whose explanation by you she liked, requires a conscious solution rather than just a functional solution. Yeah, well, I think it's... Giorgio, Giorgio. Yeah, seems to be that it's not requiring, but it's a same, in a sense the byproduct of my hypothesis, because if the original response of organism was a bodily reaction, and associated with the bodily reaction, there is the deference copy. Deference copy is simply providing, uh, so to speak, the reason for action in the sense that the sense of authorship, which is associated with sen sen sentience, is because it is motor activity. And we feel that this motor activity is our motor activity. In this sense, I think, uh, the efference copy is linked with the, with the, with with sanctions. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right that motor is special, but motor is functional too. Right uh, into uh, my body versus some other some other part of the uh, the universe. That's a functional distinction. You can do that without having to feel anything. Yeah, but you have to recognize that you are the author of that particular. Uh, piece of motor action in order to have sanctions, right? I'm not sure why that's evident either. I mean, voluntary behavior is behavior that is generated by the organism, and involuntary behavior is behavior is, is things that are triggered outside the organism. But that distinction is a functional distinction, like everything else. This you were up against the hard problem there, and probably we should back off because you're not going to have. A, a, a very convincing explanation of this. It's there and it's real. And there's certainly felt, felt states, but why uh, inner outer distinction should dictate them or imply them is not clear at all. That's just mm -hmm. my reaction. Uh, other panelists. Yes, Jennifer. Yes, I think to some extent, I see the reafference that Giorgio is describing very nicely as being a basic principle behind all that we're discussing. So it's a starting point, but it's a necessity if we're going to believe in sentience. Well, could you spell that out a little bit? What is the starting point? What, what in particular? Well, what I see sentience as being, I have to try to figure out how to say this. If you have, a stimulus and a reaction, that's not sentience. If you have a stimulus and you have a valuation and then an action, that suggests sentience. And the evaluation comes only if you have some kind of monitoring, not only of what is going on externally, but what is going on in yourself. Does that make sense, Giorgio? Yes, I agree on that. I mostly agree. Um, I think that it, it is a sort of uh, 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 what is intriguing to me in the mechanism of the reference copy is the idea that in the comparator you have a sort of uh, mechanism delaying uh, and waiting for the arrival of something. And it is this waiting time for the arrival of something which is crucial. So we can 
relate this, for instance, to the discussion of having, say, sanctions in, 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 in plants. The reason why I, I wouldn't expect that, even assuming that they can be ascribed some sort of uh, uh, motoric activity that they don't have, they are simply growing up. The point is that the timing, in any case, associated with some sort of efference copy will be so long to make very implausible to me that they have some, some form of sanctions. Okay, uh, uh, Lars, you had a comment. Um, am, I, am I muted? No. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, yeah, so I think this, this uh, question of whether some form of the efference copy might be at the root of um, intelligent life and, and, uh, and sentience and so on is actually a very interesting one. Uh, I think it's been expressed before by others, but the, the idea there is that as opposed to the, the sort of hierarchy of cognitive processes that we've been taught about um, in earlier decades that you sort of have simple associative learning at the very bottom and then sort of rule learning and categorization, then self other distinction and then consciousness might be wrong. It might well be in theory, at least that in the context of being a moving animal that has to predict outcomes of its own actions and disentangle sensory input that re results from intended mo motions um, from, from external change and so on, is at the very root of animal behavior or of, of what it means to be an, an, a moving animal that makes sense of sensory input. And all the other cognitive functions might actually have come after that. But that's speculative, of course. I don't know how we would prove that. Are, are you, when you're saying these things, are you discussing the nature of sentience or are you discussing criteria for inferring that there's sentience? There's a difference. There, there is, but I'm, that, I'm not sure if that's what I, what I refer to. I'm just saying, I'm, I was talking more about the evolutionary sequence of um, implementations that we were led to believe, I guess, in earlier decades as being sort of uh, um, increasing levels of complexity where consciousness is at the very top. And I think there is an interesting suggestion here, suggestion that some level of sentience or consciousness might have been at the very bottom of animal evolution with everything else having come later. Yeah, so the I, criteria I, by which we judge whether sentience is present, I think are independent of that. They, they might help us diagnose it in, in various animals, but that's not necessarily relevant to this argument. Well, I, I, I think all of us would sort of, dis, we, we, we would agree with you on that. Uh, but the question still remains, does that mean that we can rely on this, the inner outer distinction as being our uh, sort of ec coextensive with sentience or not? And I think the answer is no. And I think you agree that the answer is no. What, what you are saying is that it might be very early in phylogenesis where this self other distinction came and was also sentient for reasons unknown and we can use it and we can rely on that. Am I restating it correctly? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, very bad, we're agreeing. Here's something uh, we could disagree about. Um, uh, Kristen Andrew, Andrews suggests that uh, we're taking, why are we taking the upside down null hypothesis? Or at least, why is it that our null hypothesis is an upside down one? Why is it that we're assuming that uh, organisms are insentient unless proven sentient rather than the other way around. Anybody? I think it's addressed to you. I'm not quite sure what to, whether to answer or not when uh, when the questions are, are to everybody. Yeah, Irina, did you want to answer? I mean, I, I just agree with the question. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> we ought not to start with either presumption. I think we ought to follow the evidence, um, which sounds easier than it is, but I don't think we should prioritize either null hypothesis, either that they have it or that they don't. Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I, if, the, if we're thinking about a policy context where one's deciding 
how to set the scope of animal welfare law, I think one can't just say that all invertebrate life receive, you know, is immediately protected because we have absolutely no idea how to do that for the huge amounts of zooplankton, et cetera, microscopic invertebrate life. What we want are protections that really mean something and that are enforceable and that do have detail. And if we want detail and enforceability, et cetera, it has to be based on detailed evidence. And I, and I think we only really have that detailed evidence at the moment for, for cephalopod mollusks like uh, Jennifer's octopuses and uh, decapod crustaceans like, like Bob Elwood's crabs and lobsters. But I think it's a realistic possibility that we'll have that sort of quality of evidence for insects, per, perhaps starting with bees in the medium term. But in the end, I mean, it's because we want sentience to matter in practice in real animal welfare laws that I think we don't start with the assumption that everything down to, uh, to zooplankton, you know, is assumed sentient. Along the same lines, Yamina Venuta asked, could, well, might sent, sentience in a very thin sense begin at the, multi, at the multicellular scale itself before the appearance of nervous systems? Uh, maybe maybe uh, Bob Elwood would have something to say about that. You need to turn on your you need to turn on your sound. Oh, sorry about that. It's something I've thought about, and, and it's just very very difficult to get an answer. I'm trying to think in the evolutionary terms rather than moral terms, um, because I'm a biologist, and that's how I think. And uh, I, th I think it, it's it's useful to look at the distinction between nociception and possible pain. And nociception is simply a perceptive me mechanism which enables the animal to withdraw from a stimulus. And, 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 and it's, it's a very useful thing. It's good that that provides a, a lot of advantages to get away from a noxious stimulus. But what it doesn't do by itself is to uh, give any awareness about what's happening. So the big disadvantage of pure nociception is that the animal may well go back to the stimulus that provided the, the noxious, uh, the, the, the tissue damage, and it might just withdraw. And it, 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 it doesn't provide for long-term protection. But in my approach was to simply ask, well, are, can you design experiments and ask, are, are these things purely nociceptive? Or are they reflexes? Or are they more complex? And, and I was quite surprised in the work uh, that again and again, it was shown that they were more, the, the responses couldn't be described satisfactorily as reflexes. So that to me is, when I started thinking about this, I was only thinking about pain uh, and um, not the term sentience. And yet pain uh, is, is assumed to be the fundamental aspect of sentience by, by some people at least. And, and, and it's, it's also the means by which we might recognize whether an animal could suffer. We, we, we generally assume that if an animal is in pain, then it could suffer. Um, but but I, I believe that there are ways forward in teasing out whether a, the behavior could be explained in very simple terms uh, or whether there might be some gain uh, for the animal in having more complex abilities such as knowing where the stimulus was on its body. Can it direct its attention to that area of the body? Uh, can it aid uh, healing processes? Uh, can it avoid in the future? Is there learning? Is there swift learning? The, these are all expectations of, of pain. And I think that, that, is, that is the way that I've taken. So, Bob. Uh uh, biologically, and this is uh, addressed to Bob as well as to Jennifer and Giorgio and Lars, what does the notion of neutral, neutral sentience, not, not having nothing to do with preference uh, or, or, or uh, say, your, if your gnosis, can your nociception be neutral? That is to say, a signal that impels an animal to, uh, to uh, withdraw from a uh, damaging stimulus but not feeling anything at all. 
that's negative or positive, perhaps feeling a sensation, but not negative or positive. I, I would say that is a neutral experience. If, if you're not feeling anything, if all you're doing is, is withdrawing by reflex, then, then it has no, no, no lasting effect on the animal. Yes, but do you think it exists? That you're, you're saying a feeling that doesn't feel good or bad, it just feels like something. Well, no, I, I, I would say uh, uh, you can imagine in, in those exceptions that there is no feeling. There's no feeling that it's good, no feeling that's bad, no feeling that I really don't care. But it seems like in those cases, there's no feeling at all. So it's not a matter of having feelings with a neutral valence. It's a matter of mm. not feelings whatsoever. Um, and if I may, Stephen, I think, um, may this be an example of a neutrally valenced feeling? So if I'm, if I'm thinking about, uh, <sighs> Uh, let's say Azerbaijan. I don't have very many feelings about it. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it. There's something that it's like for me to think about it, but it's not positive or negative. Um, and maybe I can reflect on it a little more and it'll be positive or negative. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's neither one. So might those kinds of experiences count? And if so, is that an example of the kind of sort of neutrally valenced state that doesn't matter morally whatsoever, and at least like a uh, and in principle, uh, demonstration that those kinds of states are possible. And yeah, With apologies Irina, to any Azerbaijanis in the audience. I'm sorry. Irina, I would argue that if you are thinking about Azerbaijan, there is some reason already that you're thinking about Azerbaijan. There really wasn't. <laughs> Everything that came to mind at first, there was a reason. Um, but Yes, so, so it's not neutral, even though you present it as a neutral example. In a way, the neutral example would ha have to be someplace out there that neither you nor I was thinking about. As soon as we start thinking about- well, An unthought thought, right. Yeah, I think yeah. as soon as we start thinking about something, we imbue it with value. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptical, like Jennifer, I think, of the idea that human experiences are ever completely evaluatively neutral. I think it's a conceptual possibility that we can entertain the idea of a sort of an imaginary being that, that only has completely neutral experiences. It's hard to make sense of as a realistic evolutionary possibility in that I think every plausible hypothesis about the evolution of sentience at some point brings in a link to evaluation. So I think it's in, possibly in that category of conceptually possible, but not evolutionarily plausible. Uh, along similar lines, this is to Giorgio. Uh, of course, a uh, blind sighted monkey, creating to, to the creation of which I immediately want to raise an objection, but that's me. Uh, a blind sighted monkey is not insentient, it's just blind. So uh, those videos that you showed are just as compatible with the fact that they are doing things on the basis of stimulation, but it's not seen. Right. Well, I think that there are some nice experiments showing that in fact, you can have an equivalent of the kind of verbal report that uh, is available for our species suggesting that they are really blind sight. And so there is a, normal condition in which uh, they are not, uh, they are experiencing something. You know, probably there is some old work by Conway and others showing that uh, if you train monkeys to provide a sort of categorization response to a stimulus, that is the stimulus is there or the stimulus is not there. So imagine you are a flashing light and you have to push a red button if you see something. And if it is not presented the stimulus, you have to push a, a green button, okay? So the question is, what happens when a stimulus is presented into the scotoma, into the blind field? What happens is quite interesting because if you ask the monkey to guess, to, for instance, to point to the stimulus, they do that. But if you ask to categorize, they say there is nothing. So they show exactly the same kind of behavior that is shown by human subjects. The only difference is that rather than having a verbal report, you have a motoric report. But epistemologically speaking, it, 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 there is not any special status for me for verbal report with respect to other kinds 
of, uh, of motoric responses. Yes, you can get that in monkeys and you can get that in humans, but it doesn't settle the question of when a monkey points to it, but uh, uh, blindsided by something. We're asking about their sentience. Is it on the basis of a feeling that they're doing that or on the basis of made me it? The candidates um, for feelings are, for example, an, an impulsion to move your arm in that direction. Yes, sorry, there has been some interruption in your video, so I'm not I have been not able to understand your, your question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, the, it's not, this is not coming from me, it's coming from other people. By the way, Nick, Nick Humphreys, if you're there now, he was, he was on the list, you can join in if you have a view on this. He was the one that did these, Nick, Nick Humphrey, these um, blindside experiments. The point is, on what basis is a, a blindsided human or a primate, or if it's possible in other species that has been deprived of the primary source of visual information, but is still getting inputs that are that may be correlated with the visual information that's still picking up in a sensory, meaning a sensation way. But you mean that obviously the issue of blind sight is limited in several respects because it's a pathological condition and because it refers to a limited uh, uh, a, a, a range of sensory experience. So it is limited to the specific scotoma in which there is no uh, uh, phenomenical response when you ask the subject to see, do you see something? And the patient say, no, I don't think any, anything. Obviously, I'm not arguing that it is the equivalent of the philosophical zombie in all circumstances, but it is no, no. proof of it in any case. Yeah. But no, we don't have to resort to zombies. We just have to say to the patient, not do you see something, but did you feel anything just then when you yeah. flashed it in, in the scotoma? I think that they would say, I you don't feel I mean? it. Yeah. I, I, I think that they, they, they will say that I don't feel anything. And in fact, you have to convince the patient to do the motor action. To, to, to try the, the point of, or to try or to try the, 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 the grasping because they don't feel anything. The trouble is that this is too uh, human centric, this, this kind of a question. When I say, did you feel anything? I'm thinking psychophysics where you, where you don't say to a human being, do you see anything? You simply say, I'm right. gonna put you in a, 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 an environment you can't see I'm going to do some stimulation. Tell me when you think it, it's happening and when it's not happening. And they can, they will be able to do it. If they could do the pointing, they could do it. And then you say, what, what was the different feeling? And then you get them to introspect on what did it feel like that made you able to say, now it's happening, now it's not happening, but I don't see a thing. Anyway, uh, uh, let me not dwell on that because it's too far away from octopuses. Uh, Jennifer. Yes, Stephen, to some extent, I think we we have taken blind sight as a huge phenomenon that is unique. First of all, we're forgetting that our use of language is different from all the other animals. So when we say, gee, you can't give a linguistic explanation of what's going on, well, so that, that's not relevant to other animals. But remember what I said about the octopus does not appear to visually self-monitor. Any kind of information by any reasonably complex brain is handled at several different levels. So the cephalopods, in fact, have what's been called lace, like activated chromatophore expansion, it has nothing to do with the brain. They also have visual navigation, very important they don't seem to have visual self-monitoring. So we have to look at how animals, not just us, but every animal handles different information where they don't use it, where they do use it. And it does not necessarily link to sentience. And I'd like maybe Jonathan and maybe Bob to say if they see that kind of parallel in other animal groups. 
Bob? I'm, I'm not sure whether I really grasped your point there. Sorry, Jennifer, could you, could you say that again? Is there only one way of handling, only one level of processing, only one set of tasks that the uh, hermit crabs use vision for? Or for no, that they, matter, use chemical information for? They, 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 they use different modalities, each in, in many ways for, for, for different functions. I mean, when, when approaching a shell, it, 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 you can show that it is ev evaluating that shell visually. Um, when it's approaching uh, another crab, it is evaluating that crab, and in some cases also its shell. So, uh, but it's the, it's the crab that, that might be the important thing. That will determine whether you could attack it or it could attack you. And then it will evaluate moving shadows, etc., because that might be indicative of, of a predator and you, you, you'd be better off withdrawing. So there are lots of different things to do. And, and, and then the same function, um, which I discussed last week, where they're evaluating a shell, they draw on different sensory modalities uh, to focus on getting some sort of value. And, and, and that's what I, I see this. They, they must be coming up with some sort of evaluation of two shells and then coming up with a decision of which one has the higher value for that crab at that time in that situation. Uh, and and I'm, I'm left wondering... How can that be done? Can that be done without any awareness? Uh, are, are, are there neural mechanisms? I, I will have to have to, you know, take advice from people who know more about neurons and brain function. I, I study behavior, but but I'm I'm wondering how that can be um, w without some sort of awareness that A is better than B in this situation. Especially when when I when I showed that in different environments you can change the environment slightly, change the odor in, in the environment, and that changes their evaluation of, of the shell. So it's at that time for that crab in that situation. Can that be done without how would you any, to any, any, to any knowledge, any awareness? Say that again, Stephen. Well, I, I think that's a good answer, but it seems to me obviously that it can't be done with some kind of collective awareness. And that the integration of information across the senses and across time, Jonathan would say, is very important. Jonathan? Yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> I agree, yes. Then again, I mean, if you put the question as can this thing be done without any subjective experience? If you put the question like that, there's often a temptation to say, well, of course, conceivably, it could be done without subjective experience, because conceivability, you know, con conceivably, anything can be done without subjective experience. So it's important to emphasize that that's not the right question to ask, I think, that the question is not, is it conceivable that there's no subjective experience here, but are we seeing warning signs? Are these behaviors warning signs that there could be subjective experience behind this? And are we going to act on those warning signs or are we going to do absolutely nothing? And, and I think that's the status that this evidence from, from crabs currently has. You know, the status of warning signs that we should take um, the possibility of sentience in these animals extremely seriously. There's a, another question on the same uh, line of thought. This, a third one on the same line of thought from Walter Feit, who asked, do you to imply that science comes, uh, sentience comes in degrees rather than being an all or none property. Could each of you say whether for you sentience is all or none or a matter of degree? Perhaps starting with um, Robert. Well, I think it's gonna come back to the definition of sentience. Um, if, if you use uh, uh, the idea that it's, it's a feeling, then, then either you have feeling or you don't, but 
um, to, to that extent, but perhaps you feel more or the, the feelings might be more complex or there's more understanding going on there. But then uh, with Don Broom's definition, he brings in other features, um, awareness, uh, evaluating costs and benefits and things like that. And um, I, 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 I can see a situation where you have one, one taxonomic group having certain abilities and another taxonomic group having those abilities and perhaps something different as well. And, and indeed another one having the basic abilities and, and something different to, to the second group I mentioned. So you can have all sorts of variations, I would imagine, on, on, on sentience, on what these animals can do and what they can and how they do it, and whether they, they, they take advantage of, of what could be done with a nervous system. Because the whole idea of sentience must surely be to make things easier for the animal in, in order to make informed decisions and improve its fitness. Lars, do you have a view on the degree of sentience question? Um. I don't have any evidence in favor or against the idea that it comes in degrees, but it's very hard for me to think otherwise. So I would imagine that if, let's say, you count the, the number of emotions that any animal can feel, then that necessarily must be tailored to its lifestyle and what kind of advantages it can gain from having or not having these emotions and likewise I think along each of these let's say emotional dimensions or things like pain or suffering um, I, I would be surprised if all animals use all sentient animals use the same scales so even within the human population there's probably there are huge appreciable differences between um, how people respond emotionally to the same stimuli um, there are demonstrable differences in pain sensitivity, for example. So I would imagine that that's the case all the more so if you compare between animal species. I don't think anybody denies that uh, feelings can come in differences in, in intensity, but that's not the same as whether there can be degrees of sentience. Se um, sensations can differ in intensity. They can differ in quality too, but that's not a difference in degree of sanctions, is it? Well, I mean, I think we, we, we would have to break sentience down. A very bad internet connection on the side or I was not hearing you. So I, I think we would have to break sentience down into various emotional dimensions or qualities um, that presumably an animal can have or not have, and they would have to be demonstrated on a case-by-case -case basis. I like Bob's idea of looking at it from an evolutionary oh, viewpoint. Contestable. Finesse. Sorry, say again, Lars. I, I didn't say anything just now. I think it was... Stephen trying think, to say Yeah, we're, we're getting Stephen's sage remarks sort of drifting across in a slightly <laughs> broken way. So they still seem incredibly wise, but they don't uh, necessarily connect to what's just been <laughs> been said. Um, but yes, absolutely, there's definitely this strong temptation to say that, you know, the animal either feels or it doesn't, you know, either, either has feeling or it doesn't. And I think Stephen has been a, a prominent advocate of that view. I mean, what I do definitely agree with is that um, in ethical contexts and in policy contexts, a fairly sharp choice is forced upon us, whether whether the underlying biological property fits that description or not, that we do face this sharp choice, protect or don't protect, give some moral consideration or zero moral consideration. And that it's very difficult when you're looking at the messy biological picture to then be confronted with that sharp practical choice. But I think that is the choice we face. And, uh, you know, where possible, we need to err on the side of caution and err on the side of inclusion. Anyway, what I was saying is I, I like Bob's idea of looking at it from an evolutionary basis, because then in terms of 
what you might describe as the amount of sentience or the content of sentience. You would say, well, let's look at different animals adapted to different situations and figure out what is beneficial for that species or even that phylum. But I still like the precautionary principle where we don't know we should give an animal the benefit mm. of the doubt. You know, I, if I can just stick in a, a, another thought and whether it's, is it easier in evolutionary terms to become sentient, to experience pain, for example, to be aware of which part of the body and perhaps what's caused it? Is, is it easy to do that, uh, to, to gain that, but is it also easy to lose that? If, if there's nothing you can do, about tissue damage, if you've adopted a change over time, over evolutionary time, from, from a mobile animal to one that's sessile and can no, can no longer effectively change its behavior to, to avoid noxious stimuli, is there any point in investing in the neural apparatus that enables you to experience pain? Um, so I, it's, it's my view, but I'm coming around to is, is that it's, it's probably very easy to lose uh, that, that, that ability. Bob, I would look at barnacles. Yeah, I'm thinking barnacles or bivalves. Or, uh, well, but barnacles particularly start it, it out was like an example I used. mobile yeah. larvae, and then they yeah. settle and they can't go nowhere. So they'd be a <laughs> fascinating test case to look at. Yeah. That's another interesting yeah. example, or maybe the, the first interesting example in which larval forms of animals, which are typically assumed, um, I think using a kind of vertebrate centric model to be more advanced uh, or to be less advanced than the, the, the final adult version might actually have moral standing because they may be sentient. Uh, whereas the adult version may not have moral standing perhaps because they lose the capacity to be sentient. And I think for cephalopods, we have a tendency not to value the, as you pointed out about the number game and also the size game, that we have a tendency not to value the paralarvae as we value the adults. It's a very interesting problem. Exactly. Stephen, we can't hear you. Stephen, you're on mute. I'm here, you, Stephen. Stephen, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. But I, uh, during the, all of this time, I've been losing half of what, what you were, were all saying. Uh, could I ask Laura if we can enable Catherine Mills to uh, re read some questions? Because I can't, uh, I'm interrupted because of my bad internet connection. I can't. Kate, you just need to uh, unmute. And Stephen, if you want to um, shut off your video, you can you can read them um, just through audio. Um, sure, I can I can read a question. I'm not sure if it's uh, super relevant, but uh, this one's from um, Paul Pop. He asks, doesn't the same concept of sentience being related to lifespan and life history patterns apply to intelligence as well? In that sense, aren't the comparisons of intelligence unscientific from an evolutionary point of view? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, this is something that people have talked about in terms of cephalopods. Why have they evolved high intelligence when they don't live very long. And I think it's just an anthropocentric point of view. They have it because they need it. I'm fascinated with the idea, by the way, that honeybees have actually a very, very short period of life during which they're foragers. And yet they have evolved tremendous abilities during this to be used only during these couple of weeks, I think it is, of adult foraging life. And maybe Lars can talk more about that. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm always surprised where this idea comes from that uh, the duration of life should be in any way linked to um, cognitive ability. I mean, there are animals that live incredibly long. I mean, sea urchins, multiple decades, for example. Um, they're not very good learners, and that I think is linked to their lifestyle. Now, if you're a flower forager, for example, then the, the environment you're dealing with, foraging from flowers, changes all the time at multiple time scales. Um, so you have to be able to adapt to that very quickly, not just to learn which flowers are rewarding when, but also to extract rules about um, um, which features characterize perhaps multiple species of, of rewarding flowers, whereas you don't quite have that sort of challenge as a sea urchin. So I think it, it, the, 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 the duration of life does not matter. What matters is the, the, the duration of life in relation to the kinds of changes that you have to cope with during this time. Um, but yeah, longevity is, is meaningless in itself. Yeah, I was kind of curious. I was thinking about this earlier today. Do people think that echinoderms will ever be sentient? Do people? They don't have a brain. No, uh, sorry. C could you repeat, Jennifer? You mean like sea urchins? Uh, sentient. Yes, sea urchins. The anemones. Sea stars, um, right. No, not anemones. They're they're a different phylum. Please. Sea oh, sorry. Stars, sea urchins, um, sand dollars. Yeah. I'm afraid they don't look very sentient to me, but they don't have a brain. Does that mean they won't ever be judged to be sentient? I mean, I'd be tempted to put them in the same category as, as plants, where, uh, uh, where we have no positive evidence at all that I know of. Now, I don't want to end up saying that um, that means we can definitively rule out sentience, because I think our understanding of the nature of sentience is not strong enough to really be in, in the position to conclusively rule out. But um, when there's no positive evidence, you know, that, 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 that is a qualitatively different category to cases like the cephalopod mollusks and the decapod crustaceans, where we have all these pieces of positive evidence. So and I, I don't know if anyone wants to stick up for the sea urchins, but, but I think they're closer to the plants than to the octopuses in that respect. So I don't think that we can at least formally require the existence of a brain for there to be sentience or consciousness. Um, I think it's at least plausible that at some point we will have sentient and or conscious machines or robots without their, their having a, a nervous system. I think the, the, the argument against sea urchins is more, well, or I guess, well, I think it's an evolutionary one that relates to their lifestyle. Um, now they can still move and find, they, they also re return to repeatedly to same places and so on. So it's an interesting question, um, but by gut feeling, and I might well be wrong here, I would, uh, yes, I would agree with Jonathan that they're probably closer to plants with less of a need to um, to predict, predict outcomes of their own actions than, than properly moving animals. But um, I think we, we, there's no formal criterion to exclude things with diffuse nervous um, networks or indeed any kind of uh, um, being with, uh, with uh, information processing of any form. I think that in itself doesn't count as evidence against. Of course, one of the things we have to consider is that to some extent we've been selective about the animals we study. And yes. so because we don't know anything yeah. about sentience or possibilities of sentience in most of the phyla, we can't really say they don't have it. You know what they say, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, yeah. What's become absent right now, if you can still hear me, is any time left for our seminar. So I want to thank everybody and apologize for my absence. <laughs> thank you.
Thanks, thank everyone. You. Very good. Well, thank, thank you, for everybody. Stephen, thank God, you very my, much for having uh, us. It's been yeah. wonderful. Well, thank you for participating. It's been great. All right. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to Steve.